Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode 357 or 8 of the podcast of the Spearheads on this podcast. I'm your host, Lewis Spears. Welcome back to the show. Guys, the big swing is underway. Seven days of posting, 400,000 views, thousands of subscribers, actually making more than $2, all right? This is literally on my main channel, I think the first time in almost 12 months where I have gained more subscribers than I have lost. We're back, baby. You know what's going to happen soon? I'm going to get to hit 600,000 subscribers again. <laughs> That's right. I think my channel, I believe I was at like 640. 40,000 maybe? Maybe, I don't know if it was that big. I feel like it was, no, it was 608,000 maybe. I don't know, I think it was just over 600 and then we went under. Someone else could probably figure it out. The point is, what a milestone. 600,000 subscribers twice, baby. We're back. We're back in. It's all happening. The big swing is underway. Thank you so much to everyone liking and commenting and uh, engaging with the videos because that's why they're going so well. Um, uh, in addition to my extraordinary talent and good looks and the new chin that I've paid for. Speaking of the new chin, you know what is crazy about my analytics on the YouTube channel, right? So obviously I've been posting for, for like since 2012. So 12 years I've been posting on that channel. And I had a look at my recent analytics and the target, de the demographics of the people and everything looks super normal like it always has, right? When the views are low, it's mostly Australian. When the views are high, it's mostly American. That's how it's always been because America's naturally bigger, but I've got a big base of Australian people, right? So when Australia grows, America grows faster because there's more people. The age, it's always been uh, a couple years younger than me, but then when the channel blows up, it goes far beyond me. So it's usually when it's going well, it usually is like 18 to 35 is kind of the, the main thing. And that's normal. That's what it's been. That's what it's always been. The gender split, however, very suspicious. Something's changed. Okay. Something very big has changed. All right. For my entire YouTube career, my split of male viewers to female viewers has always been 93% male, 7% women. And I even, I saw the recent analytics and I thought, that's fucking crazy. I went back and I checked every single year for 12 years, it's been 93% male, 7% female. And that's what it is. Now I noticed something at my UK tour. Lots more women. And I just chalked it up to different culture, maybe. Maybe the women in the UK like me more than the women in Australia. Maybe a lot of my male listeners have gotten girlfriends. Maybe that's what it is. I had a look at my analytics after just one week of posting with my new face properly on YouTube. Guys, 14% female, doubled, and it's going up. You superficial whores. <laughs> Where were you when I had no chin, huh? I haven't changed. Nothing about my content has changed particularly. I'm putting in more effort. I do think it's better, but it's the same style and type. I haven't gone out of my way to attract more women to this. I, I have a sneaking suspicion that perhaps you ladies were repulsed by my face. And that would explain the unusually high amount of lesbian listeners of the Spearhead Sundays podcast because you bitches aren't interested in any of us. So you can stand to listen to an ugly person. That's how I can I can watch Asmund Gold videos because I wouldn't even a uh, dream of fucking someone of his genre. You know what I mean? The gender. Gender. 
So things are changing around here, and a lot of you fellas, you're going to have to move over and allow some queens in because I'm handsome now. Sorry, that's the reality that we live in. It's always been my dream to be handsome, but now I'm finally in. God bless Dr. Sam Verko and Dr. Peter Scott, orthodontist. For they have doubled my female audience. That's all I put it down to. It's got nothing to do with me. Dr. Sam Verko, surgeon, Dr. Peter Scott, orthodontist. That's the only reason why. The f could you Can you understand that how, how fucking crazy it is for the female audience to double? I did nothing. <laughs> I knew there was something fucking going on when I saw all those women at my shows. I was like, what's going on here? It's great. I love it. It's, it's awesome. I've always, always, always thought that my humor would appeal to women. And whenever they come to the shows, they fucking love it. But, and I'd always be like, oh, why, why does this demographic elude me? I, I know why. Because when they look at me, they went, uh, yuck. So things are changing around here, guys. And um, I'm thinking about just becoming a T channel. What do you think of that? Why don't I just become a T channel where I just talk about uh, the latest TikTok gossip? To be honest, that is essentially what I have been for my entire career. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's get into the show. I have a huge update about a few things. I'm going to get into the vice presidential debate. We're going to talk about the F boy Island finale. We're going to talk about uh, the, some Diddy stuff, some KSI stuff. And, uh, but we're going to start off. Uh, I've got a huge thing about this, uh, this thing that went down in Sydney with the, the cookie scam. It's so funny, but first an update from yesterday's episode or last week's episode. Sorry. So last week I did not want to be doing this show because I felt all sicky in my tumbus. I felt very sicky. I felt all sicky. And for two days I've been going to the toilet because I felt like I was going to shit my pants. Nothing would happen. All right. And I put it down to, oh, I, I started a new magnesium supplement. I switched brands. Sometimes when you change supplements or add in a vitamin, it can make you feel all sicky in your tumbus. So I was being very brave about it, even though I felt all sicky. And a lot of people noticed how, how brave I was being by doing the show, even though I felt all rumbly in my tumbly. And thank you very much for commenting and, and, and telling me what a big, brave boy I'm being, even though I felt all sicky in my tummy. All right? But, guys, I'm happy to say, thanks to one of the most embarrassing, horrific moments in my life, pro I, I found why I felt all sicky, okay? So, on Monday, I went to Frankston Library for a big, deep writing session. I thought I'm going to I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write some stand up. I I've got next year's show to kind of think about on the horizon. I got to write some jokes. I got to I got to write some videos. I got to plan what I want to do. Uh I got to theorize how we can get that 14% women up to 50. I got to figure this out, right? So I'm I'm writing, I'm having a great day. Get halfway through the day, I go, oh, "I'm a bit hungry." I go down to sushi train. I accidentally spend $50 on sushi train. I had about 16 plates. The Japanese woman laughed at me because there were three groups of people in line to pay before me. Uh, and they all spent less than I did. I was there by myself. And she laughed. She went, oh, ho, ho, you're very big. And I said, yes, I didn't do her voice back at her. I feel like that'd be, uh, that'd be wrong. And I would like to return there. All right. I spent $50 at Frankston sushi train. Okay. Amazing. It was so good. Go back to the library, finish up my writing, get myself a big coffee, smash it, do a bit more writing, fuck around a little bit, finish up. I'm thinking, great, what a productive, creative day I've had. And I accidentally spent too much money at sushi, whatever. I'm not going to do that again. But I had a good time, right? Then I'm thinking, all right, well, while I'm here, I'm going to go to the pool. I head, down, I head down to Frankston Pool, right? Beautiful big pool. And as you guys know, I made a big, bold claim saying that I would swim 100 times this year. Look, 
didn't go the way that I thought that it would. I've I've swam heaps. If you know you count twenty as heaps, pretty good. One fifth of the way there. <laughs> I'd start doing my laps and last time I swam, I couldn't finish a full kilometer because I was that out of practice and out of shape from swimming that I just did 500 meters. I got really hot and exhausted. And I thought I'll do a kilometer the next time I'm in the pool. This is the next time I'm in the pool. I get to 500 meters. It's feeling even harder than the last time I swam, which doesn't make any sense because I've even been going to gym. Again, something I should be fitter. What the fuck is going on? Why does this feel so hard? And then I think, oh, I actually feel really bad. I think I need to get out of the pool. But then I think, don't be a fucking pussy. What would David Goggins say? And he would say, you don't get out of the pool until the lifeguard pulls you out of the pool. You drown, motherfucker. Who's going to carry the boats? I haven't cried for 20 years. Sometimes I yell and I and I don't know why. I wish I could reconnect with the little boy that I was. Before the world got to him. But I locked him away to keep him safe and now I can't unlock the door. <laughs> I wanted to be a dancer. But I saw some shit in the war. And now I can't get my toes to move in time with a beat. Because my dad said it was gay. I hated my father, but I turned out just like him. Who's going to carry the boats? Yeah, I love dudes like that. That, that like, the only emotion they, they can do is yell. <laughs> You know, you know, guys like that. Oh, women are so um, are so emotional. Not me. I'm logical. Gets out of his car in the middle of a of a, a fucking road rage incident. Has a bat prepared in the back seat. Smashes the rearview mirror off a single mother's car because she cut him off in traffic. Traffic. Women are so emotional. Crazy bitches. What was I saying? Oh, you're at the pool, right? And I'm and I get to 500 meters, and I think I, I'm I, I'm not getting out of the pool. I'm not a fucking pussy. I'm not a coward. All right, I'm doing my kilometer, and I make a deal with myself. I go, you don't have to do it fast. You just have to do it. So I will take as many rests as I need to take. I will swim as low as slow as I need to swim. But I'm doing my fucking kilometer. I start swimming again, another 100 meters down, we're at 600. I'm feeling bad, but I've slowed down heaps. I'm feeling like courageous about it. I'm like, yeah, I'm being, I'm being brave. My tummy starts to hurt. I'm thinking, no worries, it's just a stitch. 650 meters, I start to feel fucking horrid. I'm thinking, that's all right, I'll just have a rest for like two minutes at the end of the pool, and then I'll do another 50 meters, all right? Rest for three minutes, because I needed it. Then I do another 50 meters. The stitch in my stomach is so fucking bad that I have to get out of the pool because I can no longer swim. I thought for, for safety's sake, all right, I'm getting out of the pool. And I don't want to, because I don't want to have to put my hand up and start waving it as I thrash around and drown in front of grandma's water aerobics class, okay? It's just not something that I want to do. There's a 90-year-old woman. She's barely alive. I can't drown in front of her. That's embarrassing. So I get out of the pool. And I pack up all my stuff and I walk to the change room in my ill-fitting little Speedos, okay? Because I'm not a coward, all right? I'm not going to wear those big shorts that go down to your knees. I'm not going to wear boardies with, with underwear from home. I'm wearing my, my slutty little Speedos because I'm a fucking man, all right? I'm not a coward. Laugh if you want. But I'm not afraid for that entire seniors community in the aerobics pool to see a perfect outline of my cock and ball. All right? Because I'm not a coward. I go to the change room and I must have looked so fucking bad. I must have looked 
absolutely fucking horrid. Because let me tell you, when I'm out in public and I see people that look like shit, I leave them alone. Like if I if I see if I see a, if I see a dude that looks like 10 seconds away from passing out, I just hope for the best for that guy and I move on with my day. I would have to see someone bleeding profusely for me to step in and ask, are you okay? I must have looked so fucking horrible getting out of the pool and walking into the change room because this guy comes up to me and goes, hey, dude, are you okay? And I look at him and I genuinely am confused as to why he's asking me this because of course I'm fine. I just haven't swum for a while. That's why I feel like shit, you know? So what? I didn't finish my kilometer. Let me get out of the fucking pool and get changed in peace, man. He comes up and he goes, dude, are you okay? And I just go, yeah, man, just had a big workout. And then I sit down and then I think, all right, the music is way too loud. I'm getting overwhelmed by the fucking music. There's too many people in this change room and this guy is staring at me with this concern. I just, I need to get changed and I need to get the fuck out of here so I can sit down on the grass outside the pool. So I go into the cubicle to change. I take off my Speedos and then I think, ooh, I need to shit. And then I projectile vomit fucking everywhere. <laughs> At Frankston Pool, fucking everywhere. I'm completely naked, hole out. I'm on my hands and knees driving the porcelain bus, just fucking hurling $50 of sushi into the fucking toilet. Dude, I vomited six times. And it was immediately after this guy asked me if I was okay. So from his perspective, all right, I come into the change room looking like death. He... God bless him. Concerned citizen goes, hey, man, are you okay? I look at him like an, like he's an idiot. I go, yeah, dude, I just had a big workout. Leave me alone. Walk into the cubicles. And then the next thing he hears two seconds later is, <laughs> I was on my hands and knees in the fucking toilet hurling for 10 fucking minutes, bro. I think I deserve a refund from the sushi shop. I want my $50 back because I tell you what, I flushed it down the fucking toilet, literally. I was spewing. I don't think I vomited ever that much in my life at, than, than I did at like 5.30 p.m. at Frankston Pool. I must have looked like the worst alcoholic ever. <laughs> this dude... If I saw a guy get out of the pool and stumble to the change room and then aggressively tell someone he's fine, then start vomiting in the toilets, I'd be like, oh, yeah, that's an alcoholic who, who tried to swim it off at Frankston Pool. Of course. That's not out of character at all. You know what? Thank fuck I didn't finish my kilometer because they would have had to close the pool, dude. <laughs> it was one of those spews where I had no warning I had no idea. Like there was there was not even a thought in my mind that there was a chance that I would spew. I thought I was going to the bathroom to change and then I felt like I needed to shit. And and then and then I just vomited out the other end. There is there was no way that if I finished my kilometer I didn't spew in the pool. They would have had to close that fucking pool, man. That would have been closed for the day. Although not for the day, man. You know what? You know what happens when they, when they, when someone like spews or shits in the pool. I was telling my brother this story, and we're laughing. And I go, "Oh, they'd have to close the pool for the day." And he goes, "No, they wouldn't." I'm like, "What do you mean?" And he tells me he went to a pool, right, middle of the day, school holidays, huge error, and. He pays for a casual pass, walks in. Within three minutes, someone shits in the pool. They evacuate the pool. They play like an alarm noise. Everybody gets out of the pool. Everyone's horrified, disgusted, whatever. But shit happens, right? And then my brother goes back up to reception and goes, oh, you know, 
We just got here. I just paid for a casual pass, but someone's shit in the pool. Uh, so we're going to leave. Can we have our money back? Uh, we haven't even gotten in the pool yet. We haven't even changed. And the guy goes, oh, if you hang around for 20 minutes, it'll be clean again. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. I, th I would like for it to be closed for a lot longer than 20 minutes, brother. What do you mean? You're telling me that someone can diarrhea in a pool and you can clean it in 20 minutes. I can barely clean my own body in the shower under 20 minutes. What the fuck are you talking about? Someone shit in an Olympic sized pool. You can get every fucking speck of baby poo out of the pool. That's made me feel so bad about swimming. You know what I think happened? I think I accidentally gave myself food poisoning because I ate chicken that I cooked like maybe eight days before, like just too long. I think that's what it was because I've only gotten food poisoning twice in my life and the pool vomit was one of them. So there's only been, I've only been food poisoned one other time and it was exactly like this, which you guys saw on last week's podcast, right? I eat the poisoned food and then I don't get sick at all for five days. And then after day five, I just feel a little bit off, but I won't actually be sick for another week because I don't even realize that I've got fucking food poisoning. I, something's telling me that's got to be autism, dude. Like, I don't even fucking know that my entire body has food poisoning. Because I'm just like, I want to go to the library. I want sushi. I don't think it was the sushi. It's a really good place. And also, I ate it hours beforehand and I felt fine. I think it was the, actually the chicken that I had like 10 days before. Because the last time this happened, uh, I went to Thailand and stupidly on the last day had beef bolognese and the person that I was with had the same meal. Now they vomited on the plane ride home the next day. I, who ate the same poison beef meal, powered on for a fucking week after that. They were going, I can't believe that you're so sick. You're, I can't believe that you're not sick because I was so fucking sick the day after and then for three days after that and you're just normal. What's going on? And I go, I don't know. I guess maybe I got a good bit and you got a bad bit. Who knows? I thought that I just had a, a harder constitution. Then, like day 10, I feel fucking horrific, but I've got a gig. I do my set. I go there. The person I went to Thailand with is like, you can't go. You're fucking sick. I'm like, no, I have to do this gig. It's very important. It's like in my first year of stand-up. I have to do it. I go there. I arrive. The host goes, dude, are you okay? I go, yeah, man, I'm fine. Exactly the same as the pool. I get up on stage. I am not even sure. I've got a seven-minute spot, and for the entire seven minutes, I'm not even sure if I spoke English. I've got no I, I did Whatever I did, I don't know. I don't know what it was. I bombed. I ate shit. I did fucking terribly. I got off stage. I went home and I vomited for an hour. Finally, I was actually sick 10, 11 days after being food poisoned. And I think that's exactly what happened at the pool. So that's a real low point in my fitness journey this year is going to Frankston pool and spewing my guts up in in a a a fucking toilet a public pool dunny while there's like 30 dudes in there changing who just heard me go yeah man I'm fine Ugh! it was not good it was not good at all but I feel a lot better. Dude, is there anything better than than like the fucking 40 seconds after you vomit? I don't think there's a better feeling on earth.
than the, the absolute euphoria you feel after spewing. This sounds quite eating disorder of me, but... <laughs> But I promise that's not what I mean. I'm talking about natural spews. Not, not regret, regret after a binge spew. I'm talking about a nice, natural, I've eaten some poison spew. I ate bad chicken vomit. There's nothing better than, uh, than fucking screaming into a toilet bowl and then going, ah. it fucking feels good. And then the reality of having spew in your nose hits you. And then it doesn't feel so good anymore. <sighs> anyway, many of you will be very glad to know that, if, that the F-Boy Island uh, dating show that I was on has finally finished. The last episode came out. The, the winners were announced. Um, that's great. I'll talk about it later. Give me a, a give me a bit more time and I'll talk about it. I can't look. That's all. But it's over. <laughs> and we'll talk soon, all right? <laughs> All right, this episode is sponsored by Manscaped. Use code 20 Spears for 20% off and free shipping your Manscaped products, okay? 20 Spears, 20 Spears. I may have said the wrong code last week. It's 20 Spears. That's the discount code, manscaped.com. Uh, now, should we do the male uh, ad copy or the female ad copy? Let's go for the doubled female audience. Let's go with the with the lady, um, the lady copy. 2024 Beard and Dome Bundle Female Host Script Introduction Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Manscaped, the global leader in men's lifestyle and grooming. As the cooler months roll in, make sure your man has his entire grooming routine covered. Oh, they've got a spelling error here. Make sure your man has his entire grooming routine covered with Manscaped's new Beard and Dome Bundle. The Dome Shaver Pro offers a close, smooth shave that will have his scalp shining brighter than his already promising future. You heard it there, ladies. Whether he's managing an untamed beard or fine-tuning that precise stubble, the Beard Hedger is up for the challenge. Head over to manscaped.com and use code and join the over 11 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by using code 20 Spears for 20% off and free shipping. Talking points, <clears throat> big red text. Do not read. Host to talk about a time when he nicked his face using another face razor or share a funny story. I thought this was for the female host. should say her, her face. Host to talk about a time where she nicked her face using another face razor or share a funny shaving story. How has Manscaped helped your confidence? What do you like about both products? Well, as a woman... If I ever need to shave my head completely bald, I like to use the um, the beard and dome bundle. The Dome Shaver Pro is, is my favorite because as we know, women, we love to be bald. And that's why I can highly recommend the Dome Shaver to shave my head bald because I've used other dome, other head shavers and I've nicked the top of my beautiful female skull. And that's not okay. So I need you to use code 20 spears at manscaped.com to get free shipping and 20% off uh, their products. I use the, the, the beard trimmers on the way. I ordered it. It's it. I'm, I'm excited. I'm going to be using that. Uh, I, I use the, the, the lawnmower 5.0 on my, on my privates. And let me tell you, it's great. It's the best shaver I've ever used. Unironically, that's the truth. Okay, I've been saying this to people even when I'm not sponsored by them. They're great. All right, I sh I'm sure their beard trim is great, and I'm sure for all you ladies who want to shave your head bald or some fellas, uh, you should get their dome thing. Twenty spears is the discount code for twenty percent off and free shipping at manscaped.com. Please, for the love of God, use the code because this is how I do the ad reads. So if, you, if, if, if it doesn't work, they're going to make me do them properly instead of funny. So manscaped.com, 20 spears. All right. 
The vice, the vice presidential debate was uh, this week, and it was, dude, it was very interesting to watch. It was Tim Waltz from the Democrats, the vice president, uh, well, the the want to be, the want to be vice president to vice president, hopeful to be President Kamala. Um, versus uh, J.D. Vance, who wants to be vice president for Donald Trump. And, man, you know what I, th- you know what I thought going into this? I thought, it, I thought that it was going to be more of what we had seen, which was just like two fucking, like just a clown show, right? But it was the most reasonable debate that I have ever seen from America. Right, it made me go within about thirty minutes of it starting. From both sides, they both made me go, "Why aren't these the two people that are running?" They had reasonable back and forths. They could clearly articulate their policies and how they feel they would be the solution to actual real problems that people are solving people are facing. They were able to disagree with one another and explain why and then rebut the person disagreeing with them in a respectful way that was clear and easy to understand as uh, for someone who's not a politician. There was like no insulting done. There were no dunks. It was just like, Here's why I think can do the uh, here's why I think I can do the job better and why I think their idea is wrong. And then the other person will be like, well, respectfully, I disagree for this, 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 and I think that my solution is this, and it would solve this problem better than that guy's solution. And I think that he's done these things. Duh, duh, duh. And it was just like that for pretty much the entire time. And the only crazy bit were some of the faces that Tim Waltz made, which were very funny. Uh, and and when Tim Waltz said that I've, I'm friends with lots of school shooters and who's not friends with a school shooter, okay? Who isn't friends with someone who's tried to shoot up a school? We've all been in, in a Discord group chat we probably shouldn't have been in. We've all been in a Discord server that we would be very upset to know the FBI was in also, okay? We've all been there. We've all received a meme from a school friend they haven't heard from for many years that looked very alarming. We've all been... Who hasn't befriended a school shooter? Now, of course, he did mean he's befriended victims of school shootings. (laughs) But what a flub. What a mistake. Um... But yeah, I don't know. It's just like watching it. It just made me go, oh, these two should be the presidential candidates. It shouldn't be Kamala and Trump. Like these two are the two people that should be running because both of them clearly have very, very different ideas and different um, solutions. But for pretty much the entire debate, both of them agreed on the problems And we're like, I see these issues that normal people are facing and that's wrong and I'm going to try and fix it. Here's my idea. I haven't heard that shit from a presidential candidate uh, since, I don't know, I started paying attention to American politics. I started paying attention when I was, you know, old enough to kind of give a fuck around uh, the, the end of Obama's term. And that was maybe the last time I heard, this is my idea for a problem that I see normal people are facing. And from the minute Obama left and it was like, fuck, who's it going to be, Clinton or Trump? It was just like spectacle and hyperbole and culture war bullshit. But these two were like, all right, here's how I think we can make a positive impact on the world when it comes to our environmental policy. I couldn't fucking believe what I was hearing. I was listening to a Republican candidate talk about clean air and water and why they think uh, 
actually uh, moving manufacturing back to the United States would be better for climate change and the environment overall globally because first world countries and Western nations are just better at reducing pollution while manufacturing where countries like Bangladesh, India, China don't really give a fuck about it at all. So they just create and pollute and who cares? I mean, that's why shit from Sheen is so cheap because it's made by child slaves who are throwing their excess plastic fibers into the sea <laughs> because they have no other option. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Like listening, listening to it the whole time I was like, Oh, true. That's a good, that's a good point. Oh, I hadn't thought of that before. Oh, you know what? I agree with this guy on immigration, but I actually really agree with this guy on the economy. Hmm. They're both making reasonable. And it's like, why the fuck isn't that what the politics is? That's what it should be. And I feel like that's why I went on Twitter and most people were just, I feel like everyone who, I mean, you've got to be a bit of a fucking nerd to listen to a vice presidential debate, right? You have to be an absolute dork and a nerd and a loser. But I think the vibe that I got from looking at social media before and during, before everyone was like rallying together in their teams, like putting the face makeup on and wearing the costumes and their fucking hats and, and their lanyards and their, their pronoun pins and everyone was like gearing up to fucking dunk on the other team. And then as soon as it started, it was like, oh, 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 they, oh, both of these people actually seem to care about me and have ideas and seem to care about issues that I'm facing. But, well, let's hear about some solutions and see who I agree with more. Like everyone was just like, oh, so it's not just going to be, it's not just going to be flinging shit at each other. And talking about sizes of rallies and fucking, you know, it was great. It was like, it, it, I left the debate feeling very hopeful. I was like, oh, that's, that, that was nice. They should be the two people that are in charge of the Dems and the Republicans. Two politicians that despite their disagreements on policy, both see and agree on the issues and seem to genuinely care. That's what you want. Some fucking compassion from the people that are leading instead of these like fucking policy uh, avoidant owned by corpor corporate shells of people who are just fucking saying talking points and not being human beings. It's really weird what politics is. And then, and then the only guy who is being a human being, Trump is, 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 is kind of being a crazy one. You know, you can't say he's inauthentic. He's being authentically him. And the guy's a bit nuts, but yeah, I don't know. It was very, it was like, I don't know. It left me, it, it, it had me like weirdly, it had me going, Oh yeah, that felt, that's good. That's good. I'm glad that those two are running because they both give a fuck. Now, whoever wins, fuck, I don't know who wins. I keep going back and forth on it. After the debate with, I think, I think Kamala won the debate with Trump, but the vice presidential, presidential debate, literally, I think America won. Like, I don't think there was a winner. I think that it was just like whoever you agreed with more on their policies and their solution is who would win your vote. And that's what it should be. And I don't think there was a clear winner. There was there was a winner on I think on uh, on immigration, JD Vance won on uh, women's rights and abortion, uh, Waltz won um, on yeah. There was like I feel like it was like it was it's down to the it's down to the individual person who who won. Um, but yeah, I think. I don't know. I think it's just, it's, it's going to be down to the fucking wire, dude. I reckon whoever wins, it will just come down to what happens that week. Like what is done the week of the election? What happens the week of the election? Although I will say Donald Trump getting shot at for a second time and no one giving a fuck at all, bad sign. Not good for Trump. 
All right, the first assassination attempt galvanized Trump, and then I think he didn't use it, or he was too rattled by it, or something. I don't know. I just I feel like it just it just really got everyone who loved him and everyone who was on the fence about him really behind him, and then it just slipped away, and then it happened again, and then now no one gives a fuck. And I feel like it'll just be like, now the next time someone tries to kill the president, it'll be like, nah, that happens all the time. It'll, you know what it'll be? It'll be the new school shooting. The first one that really made the news. Oh my God, this is horrible. The 7,000th one. Like, nah, it just happens here. I don't know. Put more locks on the doors. <laughs> you know, it's like just a thing that, yeah, whatever. Hope it doesn't happen to my kid. Hope it doesn't happen to my candidate. You know, it'll just be that. Oh, well, at least they got a Republican. <laughs> at least they didn't get a Dem. I don't know. Be interesting. I'll be following it very closely, but it's down to the wire, man. I think I think it could go, it could go honestly, either way. It, we could be looking at Trump. We could be looking at Kamala. It could be either one. Um. Okay, so the, the last thing I wanted to talk about is... Uh, Dude, this is so funny. So there's this incredibly viral cookie business in America called Crumble Cookies, right? And they've gone viral because they just create this thing called loaded cookies, where it's like loaded fries, but it gives you diabetes instead of a heart attack. Um, and basically they uh, are in America and their business has exploded because they've gone viral constantly on TikTok and they always create new types of cookies and they look really cool on your phone and people buy them and they do like unboxings of the cookies and reviews and these things get millions and millions and millions of views and people from all around the world watch this. Now, we don't have a crumble cookie store in Australia, but lots of Australians love watching these videos and really want to try the cookies. So recently... A pop-up was announced in Sydney where a Crumble Cookie account popped up in Sydney calling themselves something like Crumble Cookie Sydney. And they go, we're having a pop-up. You meet us here. We're going to be selling Crumble Cookies all day. Now, what ensued was fucking chaos. A massive, huge line of people showed up to what they thought would be a store that actually just turned out to be kind of like a, a, a table in public with just some some people selling boxes of these crumble cookies. Now the cookies sell in America for about $8 Australian. Uh, but at this pop-up they were selling for $17.50. So people lined up and then they were told that it was, that it was this huge markup. They were really disappointed, but they thought, well, fuck, I've been waiting here, you know, for so long. And I've been watching these cookie videos for so long. I really have to try them. I can't leave without a cookie. So they pay the $17. Then, how's this? They walk away with their box. They go to their cars. They set up their smartphone. They start recording to do their review. They open up the box. The cookies look great. They take a bite. They're fucking stale. They're awful. They've gone off. They're no good. So now you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people buying these overpriced but beautiful looking cookies going to their cars and then posting reviews of this horrific, stale, old, dry biscuit that they're eating. Going, this is disgusting. Crumble cookies are awful. I don't know why I thought they would be good. Then, turns out, the people that did this pop-up are not affiliated with Crumble at all. They weren't affiliated with them. It's not an official release. They're not an official Crumble cookie store. So you might be thinking, well, hang on. How did they get these cookies? What do they do? Do they just make their own terrible cookies and then lie and say that they were crumble cookies? No. Even better. How's this for a hustle? How's this for chasing the bag? These people saw how viral crumble, how viral crumble cookies were going all across the world. They saw that we don't have any in Australia. They knew that Sydney, the influencer fucking viral capital micro trend city of the country, would be all over Crumble Cookies if there was a store. They had no money to, to rent a store, to get a food safety license, to franchise out another business. So what did they do? They thought with the bag. They thought with the money. They booked a flight to America. They flew across the fucking planet to America. They bought as many Crumble Cookies as they could afford 
boxed them up, took a flight the same day all the way back to Australia and then set up this fucking stall and started slinging stale biscuits for for a 100% markup, 1750, 1750, 1750, just flinging biscuits that are two seconds away from being eaten by the fucking bacteria that's been festering within them on the flight back. How the fuck did they get them through customs, dude? I'm pretty sure that you can't bring, you can't, I know that you can't. You can't bring food like that from the States back to Australia. We've got really, really strict biosecurity laws when it comes to bringing food. I don't know how the fuck they did it. They bring it on a boat. Maybe that's that was that's why they were so stale. They spent fucking six months on a boat, man. So funny. So now Crumble Cookies, the uh, the real Crumble Cookies have gone, hey, then this was not us. We've never sent biscuits to Australia. We don't know these people. We're very sorry that this has happened to you, but it's not affiliated with us at all. And they're looking into legal action. The government now has responded and gone, you guys were selling food without a license and food that you you maybe definitely knew <laughs> was expired food at that. God forbid anyone got sick. You're looking at the reactions to these cookies. God, that would have you vomiting at Frankston Pool. I tell you what. Maybe that's why I felt so sick. I thought it was weird that I paid seventeen fifty for a, for a fucking cookie that was stale. Rats had taken bites out of it. But as as, as awful as this is to the people who got scammed out of their money, you got to respect the hustle. That's that's an innovative idea. They took a fucking you know how long that flight is, bro. Return. That's like a twenty four hour one way trip. Imagine getting on, imagine having 24 hours on a fucking plane. You spend all the money you have on biscuits and then you've got to fly back immediately. You don't have time to have a holiday in LA. You don't have time to see the Hollywood sign. You've got to get back before your fucking cookies start to rot. The clock is ticking. Off the plane, buy the cookies. On the plane. Set up the marketing. Promote the event. Find it. Illegally set up a stall. Scam people out of doubling spending double their budget on fucking cookies that suck and then getting out of there before anyone has a chance to complain you gotta love a hustle chase the fucking bag let me fix this properly and we'll continue on dude i've been doing some uh some look into this diddy case and it's getting so much worse it's getting so much worse, dude. Now there's like minors that are being added into the case and so many more potential victims have come forward, corroborating stories, adding theirs to the list. Friends and staff are doing interviews. Ex-employees are coming forward and giving statements. This man's going away for a really fucking long time, I think. It's uh, horrific. and But then, right, what you're seeing now is every single interview, I might even do a video about this, every single interview that Diddy has done, and he's just been weird as fuck in every single one of them. I don't know if you've seen the one with Conan, where Conan's getting him to explain like what his Diddy parties are. And he essentially just describes, like, date rape. Like, he's just talking about getting as many women as possible drunk, as drunk as possible, locking the doors, turning the heater up really, really, really high so that they're more inclined to take their clothes off. And Conan's sitting there. Like, Conan was probably just like, oh, this will be funny. Let's get him to talk about his crazy parties. Maybe we'll have a laugh about, you know, some things they get up to. And the Diddy's just up there going, yeah, so what you want to do is you want to get as many women as possible in a room and then make it impossible to leave. Then you get them really drunk. And Conan's like, uh, uh, that sounds really dangerous. <laughs> you know, it's like early Conan. So he's, he's like, fuck, I can't, I can't say anything. I'm, I, I, really, I really worked hard to get this opportunity. I don't want to fuck this up. And Diddy's like, yeah, so what you do is you you ply all of these women with drugs and alcohol and then you take advantage of them with your friends. And Conan's like, oh, that sounds like a crime. Hey. 
There's now interviews with other celebrities that frequent his parties where journalists will ask them questions and anything deeper than like a super surface level question and answer is met with like so much nervousness and apprehension from the celebrity. So like a, a, a journalist will be like, oh, I hear you go to the, you go to Diddy's famous white parties. They look crazy. And the, and the celebrity will be like, yeah, you know, Hollywood's pretty crazy. We have a lot of fun at those parties. And then the journalist will be like, oh, like what? Like what? Like what type of fun do you guys have? And then the celebrity just starts having Vietnam flashbacks. <laughs> just, I don't know if you've said this. There's a great one with Ashton Kutcher. He's doing hot ones. And Sean Evans, bless his pure soul, is like, oh, you go to Diddy parties. What are they like? Do you have a lot of fun? And he's just like. (sighs) (laughs) And it's not the wings, you know. He's sweating it. It's not the wings. I might actually do a video about that. That's that's, uh, quite interesting. Just all of the celebrities talking about their Diddy party experiences. Um, but yeah, dude, I've, I've been working really, really hard on, on the YouTube thing and it's, it's really, really working. I've just gone back to my roots and I've fully accepted that when it's just me doing everything, the only thing that I'm capable of doing is this podcast and one other thing that's either clips or YouTube. I can't do anything else. Spreading myself thin, trying to do everything at once just made me be like, fuck, I'm doing everything that I do kind of poorly and not well, which made me not want to do it. But then when I did do it, it'd be inconsistent and it wouldn't really work because, you know, one week I would post three stand-up clips and no YouTube videos. And and then I would post YouTube videos for like, you know, a couple in a month while trying to do stand-up clips and I wouldn't have time to juggle it. And then, so I'm just doing this and YouTube until YouTube and Patreon pick up enough for me to hire an editor to outsource the editing for the YouTube. And then maybe I do the clips or maybe I give the clips to someone else and I still stay on the YouTube. I don't know. But anyway, I figured out the format. It's just, I start off the videos with as many fucking punchy, funny, dark, hard hitting jokes as I can. And then I go into the topic, explain what's happening in the funniest way that I can make them a lot more in depth and uh, more research than even the old Lou reviews that were only about eight to 10 minutes. Just spend like fucking 20, 30, 40 minutes on this is what's going on while keeping it as punchy as possible. Because I feel like this is my theory. And I like bringing you guys in to this because you can kind of see how it works or how it doesn't work. And I've always liked bringing you guys along for the journey of like what I'm trying to do, which is how do we build this thing up to the point where I can move to the States and be a comic there. And basically I need income that I can take with me because, you know, when I move to the States, I'm not probably, I'm, you know, it'd be cool, but I'm probably not going to be doing fucking theaters, right? I'm probably going to be making not much money. So what I need is money that I can take with me. And that's online income. That's Patreon. That's YouTube. That's brand deals, right? So that I can do that from space. And that can still work. So that's why we're building up the YouTube and the podcast. Uh, Plus, I fucking love doing them, right? They're really fun. Um, So the theory is, obviously, commentary on YouTube is huge and has always been huge. And it was really big when I started doing it, like with Lure Review and that in, I don't know, whenever I started it. Um, But commentary now, I feel... And I love, you know, it's like I love watching it. I love keeping up with uh, with online drama and like the controversies and what's going on with YouTube culture. Like it's, a, it is and always has been really a huge part of my life. So I'm genuinely interested with it. But I fucking really don't like a lot of commentary channels because they're so boring and serious, right? So much of commentary now is just like this person has destroyed their career or it's the other side of it is just some fucking soft loser like person critiquing other people for saying things that could potentially be offensive 
and calling everyone a bigot uh, while contributing nothing to culture themselves other than the critique of anyone who tries. Like it's just, and both of those are like so fucking negative. And also I feel place so much importance on things that ultimately don't really fucking matter. Sometimes every now and then you'll, there'll be a huge thing. Like the Diddy thing is a great example of like that really fucking matters. And I'm going to tell jokes about that, but I'm definitely going to have a really big serious moment in it where I'm like, seriously, this is what I actually think. This is fucking evil, but that's for fucking sex trafficking. If it's a a YouTuber that's made a bad song, right? Some people will come up with a 40 minute video about someone who's made a song and they'll be like, this is the worst fucking thing. They've they've ruined their career. And it's like, dude, it's, it's, like they've made a bad song. That should be really fucking funny and entertaining, right? I think that there is a huge crossover, potential crossover, because I don't, I, I don't know, this doesn't exist on YouTube, as far as I'm aware anyway, of someone who understands YouTube culture and can talk about it and understand it and live and breathe it and critique it and someone who's like genuinely very comedian funny who can tell jokes that are like jokes that you could tell on stage that would be funny that aren't like, because a lot of, I don't, I don't mean to say that there's no funny commentary. What I mean to say is that generally from what I see, commentary that is funny is funny because of editing and memes of people saying popular memes or editing in memes or um, chopping things up, sound effects, music, uh, distorting faces, things like that. And I've done all of that type of stuff in my videos before, but it's never been like the main way that I try to be funny. I think there's such a huge crossover in people who are interested to know in internet drama and internet culture, but don't think it's very important at all and aren't the type to get outraged by shit, right? They want to stay updated, but they don't want it to be like, this is the most serious thing ever, right? And then between those two, you've got like comedy fans who like uh, humor through words, actual fucking jokes, right? I can do all three of those things. I can cover what's happening online without treating it like it's the most important or serious thing in the world and without being like, abysmally negative, right? Uh, And I can do funny without having to rely on fucking edits and that like super loud in your face, quick choppy editing style because I can use my fucking words and, uh, and I can write quick sketches like the little sketch that was in the Diddy video of me in, in the fucking bathroom, right? It's stuff like that, that I think, can really work well that I don't see at all right now anymore. It used to be done a little bit and fuck, I used to do it when I was more healthy, but I'm not seeing it anywhere. Every commentary channel is like some soft boy saying the approved opinions for uh, a very lefty social justice audience that will turn on him the second he steps out of line. And you see that happen all the time. Creators canceled by their own audience because they have one wrong opinion despite being correct all the way. And that's why that's, I don't like that shit because those people only stick with you because they think you're some kind of moral arbiter of this is what's correct and this is what's true. So the minute that you prove yourself to be fallible, like all of us humans are, they turn on you, they eat you alive and then they move on to the next person. Happens all the time. Um, and this happens with right-wing people too, right? It's not, it's not a left or a right thing. It's just like, you never really see right-wing people talking about you, YouTube culture or anything. They're mostly, they're mostly talking about culture wars, bullshit, like trans people and fat chicks and all that. That's some, some of that can be funny and they, I, they, there can be some humor to be found in that, but I generally avoid it because I don't care. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of, I, I feel like, there's a huge comedy. I feel like I'm I'm one of the only people on the website that has the ability to fuse stand-up comedy and like YouTube culture because I'm a fucking I'm a stand-up comedian, but I am also a YouTuber. 
Most stand-up comedians with big YouTube presences are big because they're hilarious on podcasts, right? Which is amazing and very difficult to do, but it's not YouTubing. It's being a podcast. They, they don't make YouTube videos. The only uh, Most of them make sketches or some of them make uh, like uh, like stand-up clips and stuff like that as well. And that's how they build these audiences. But But hardly any people who can really, really do stand-up can also really, really make a YouTube video. And I confuse both. So that's why when you open up my videos, I'm trying to make it look like I'm performing, right? I've got the microphone. I've got the mic stand. It's exactly how I have my setup when I'm on stage. I've got sta- I've got lights that are meant to look like theater lights. So they're actually really high and they cast a big shadow behind me. And that's why I've given the set depth and I've got these show lights, these red tube lights here, and you can't see them. You can only see one of them in the video, on the YouTube videos. You can't see them in the podcast. But behind me, I've got hair lights, which you generally have to illuminate you and set you apart from the background in a live performance setting. But I've got those in my YouTube set to make it look like a stage. And I'm trying, at least with the first one, two minutes of every single video, to really sit down for like an hour, two hours, sometimes more, and write written, punchy jokes, uh, like as if I was to go on stage to talk about Diddy or if I was to go on stage to talk about fucking (laughs) Logan Paul and KSI, I'd be like, all right, I'm going to write some fucking jokes Um, and then break it down and go into it and um, break up the information with as many jokes as I can kind of think of on the fly or write down beforehand and also do some sketches. And that, I'm going to do just that. I know that a lot of people want like sketches or stunts or stand up and all that kind of stuff. And I want to do that too, right? But what I need to do to fix everything, to bring the audience back onto YouTube and also to show the YouTube algorithm that I can create consistently to make it know that it can actually push my channel out there without me disappearing. I need to do one thing for like three months, and I'm just going to do this and the thumbnails are going to look the same and the titles are going to be similar and the videos are all going to have the same setup and I'm going to do it exactly like this. It will improve in time as time goes on. I've already thought of lots of different ways to improve it, but it's not going to have drastic sweeping changes because I need a format that I can stick to and deliver on and it's fucking working, bro. I know this is very like into what's going on with my shit, but I got a lot of comments on the last episode, people interested in it. And, and I like, I don't like when creators don't open up their door and show them what's going on. So this is what, this is my, my theory and what's happening. Right. So my theory was there would be a rational type of abstract thinking about a phenomenon or the results of such thinking. Would you like to hear more? God, that scared the fuck out of me. Siri just talking to me. My theory. Know how to respond. Shut up! No. <laughs> I've, I've got. A, I've got, me and Siri has a, have a very combative relationship. My theory. My theory is there are so many people like me that are super interested in YouTube drama and YouTube culture and and internet news and media and politics and celebrity um, pop culture news like I am uh, and politics and like uh, culture war stuff, but they don't like it being treated super fucking seriously. Like everything's the end of the world. Everything's super negative. Everything's the end of someone's career or the end of life as we know it. Like they want to be entertained as they are informed. And there's a lot of people that fucking love stand-up comedy as well. And if I can cross those two niches together, I will end up with a huge audience of people that are locked in to long-form content, YouTube, this podcast, and they'll understand that what I'm doing is jokes and comedy and that will lead them to come to a show. That will lead to lead them to when I do get the channel in a much healthier space where videos are getting views more consistently and not jumping up and down like they have been for the last four years, that will mean that if I drop a comedy clip 
on a YouTube channel where every video I drop gets fucking a hundred to 300,000 views, the stand-up clips will go even further than that. So instead of me grabbing all of these clips that I've fucking made in the UK that I've got, and, and, and from this Australia tour that I've like, you know, broken my back trying to get and work myself to death trying to film, instead of wasting them by dropping them on a channel that sometimes does 10,000 views, sometimes does 100, sometimes does seven, I can drop it onto a really healthy place where my uh, stuff will get pushed out to people who want jokes, right? Um, and, right, that will lead us to the ultimate fucking goal, which I am not, you know, not locked in on, but I'm really thinking about end of next year, maybe crowdfund for another comedy special and do it even bigger and better, right? So that if we shoot it towards the end of the year, we then have a bunch of time to edit it and then we finish off the year or start the next one with a fucking amazingly shot, beautiful, uh, hilarious stand-up comedy special and we put it on online and maybe it goes fucking ballistic. I don't know. That's the theory and right now what's happening is if I look at my analytics uh, and I normally talk about this like more inside stuff on Patreon but I just wanted to because it's been working so well and because I'm seeing all of your comments and stuff I wanted to tell you like what impact that's having in just a week okay so in seven days 463,000 views views are up like over 1,000%, right? Which is fucking crazy. 1,084% more, right? So the last three videos got uh, 200,000, 70,000, and the one that I just put out fucking, when did I put it out? Yesterday is on its way to 100,000. Is that 93? So it might even do 150 by the time the next couple days end, Right? So it's really, really working. But here's the crazy thing. These views are not from subscribers. Like I'm getting a lot of subscriber views, but they're all fucking new, dude, right? So returning viewers out of the almost half million, 57,000 people are subscribers or people who have watched me before, even if they're not subscribed. Over a quarter million of them have never seen me before ever, never watched the Lewis Spears channel. So that's led to almost 5,000 fucking YouTube subscribers coming in off three videos. One week of me nailing down this format and fusing stand-up comedy with internet commentary while not taking it seriously, right? I think, ladies and gentlemen, we've nailed our fucking format and doubled our female audience. That, I will say, has nothing to do with me. That's all on my surgeon and my orthodontist. Thank you very much, boys. But this is the, the way out, man. This is the way forward. This is how we get real talk back. This is how we get cooking without instructions. This is how we get budget to do tour vlogs. This is how we get budget to do stand-up clips. This is how we get budget to do even better YouTube videos to bring back all of those stunts to uh, do things like Spears vs. America. Um, this is how we blow up Spearhead Sundays and get huge guests on this show. That is how we do it, okay? So I just wanted to thank you so much to everyone who's been jumping on board and commenting and liking the videos. Every single video, it literally tells you why your videos are going well. And it says two things. This video has a higher retention rate, which means just generally means the videos are better quality so people are watching for longer and not tuning out. So people who click on it get what they came for, right? But the other thing, which is more powerful that sits atop that is this video. It says something like this video is getting more views because people who regularly view your channel are engaging with it more than they used to. So the likes and the comments, I know it's fucking very YouTuber and very cringe and shit to be like, like and comment and subscribe and shit, but it fucking works, man. 
So thank you so much if you're doing that. Um, yeah, the big swing. Week one, complete. Thank you for helping. Thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting. And I will check in with you uh, next Sunday, but we're going to continue on the Patreon right now, which is up. Check the description or the top comment. You can watch it right now on Patreon and you get early access to every podcast they do as well as every single Patreon episode backlog. All right, I'm Lewis Spears. The big swing's underway. I'll talk to you next Sunday and I hope you have a shit one. Bye.